After a couple of all-nighters, the Minnesota legislature completed their work. This week we sat down with Blaine's two newest state legislators to get their reactions to the session and the final budget agreements that were passed. The Minnesota legislative session went into overtime, but lawmakers passed all the omnibus budget bills needed to keep the state running, and Governor Dayton has signed them into law. This week, after a few days away from the Capitol, local lawmakers reacted to the end of the session. That's generally how it goes if you look at the last several sessions. It's always down to the last minute. Special sessions aren't special anymore. It was surprising that we did end up having to go into a special session, being that the governor was so clear. His staff was very engaged um, in the committee process and the bills. I think, you know, I talked to his, um, his commissioners a number of times, um, just filling me in on specific issues. I thought it went more or less all right. I mean, we kind of got, we at least got done within the first week. You know, it wasn't like 2011 where it got pushed into a shutdown and pushed into a couple weeks till after it was done. It was just kind of disappointing that, that it was kind of, at the end of the session, it was just kind of ramming budgets through instead of really getting that public input in the committees, in the conference committees, and then also making sure that the stuff that got put in was stuff that was publicly heard and not just magically appeared. Uh, as far as public input, they, all the bills that were included in these omnibus bills, almost every single word was already heard in committees multiple steps of the way. In committee, they make sure they set aside specifically for public testimony. So lots of the things had public testimony already input on their individual issues. The, the problem is that the conference, the conference committees, um, you know, there's not very much public input when it comes to the conference committees. And then we're seeing um, policy and, and projects pop into these bills that were never discussed in the, um, in the committee process. The legislature passed a large tax bill with $650 million worth of tax cuts. Republicans are hailing the bill as a victory for the Minnesota taxpayer, while Democrats are worried that it will put the state on unstable financial ground in the future. Getting rid of the Social Security income tax. Getting rid of that whole tax was enormously expensive, but we were able to put over $100 million into raising the cap so that more people dependent on Social Security income don't have to pay taxes on it. And with how long people are living today and how expensive care is, they can't hope to pay for it, so let's at least give them the ballpark hope. I think there's some good things in there. There's also some bad things in there. Um, you know, I think the Social Security tax uh, reduction is good and the student loan stuff is good, but there's also a lot of um, tax breaks for, for people who might not need them as much. Um, I'm afraid that with such a large tax bill that we will be running our state into deficits in the future. I think that in combination with the Health and Human Services Bill, I'm very concerned with the health care access fund being spent down to almost nothing um, because then that means that Minnesota Care won't be funded in the future. Another achievement was the passing of a billion dollar bonding bill. Both Kegel and West were happy to see local projects included. The Foley rail, rail um, grade separation and then the Hanson rail grade separation, those were the two um, I think that were ones that I was most concerned with because it was really more about public safety and um, safety of people you know, crossing those roads, making sure that um, emergency vehicles are not um, hung up by trains. And so you know, just kind of talk to as many people on that committee as I could, let them know how important it was, talk to John Piper, the um, fire uh, chief for Coon Rapids, about making sure that he came down and testified on that, um, on that specific bonding project. And so I was very happy to see that it was included in the um, final bonding bill. Um, and so then the next one is gonna be Foley, because um, that's also one of the most dangerous ones in the state. The most important one to me was 105th Avenue. 105th, I, I heard about it constantly, and that was a huge issue, and it's so exciting that we'll be able to have safe, safe travel between uh, the two sides of the sports center, not to mention there's a lot of people who go through there instead of 109th. Both want to see another bonding bill passed next year, and they have other items that they look forward to continuing to work on when they return to the Capitol next February. Highway 65 study, that's going to be high on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a budget year, mm -hmm. so, it, so that means we... The only thing, the only spending we'll generally do is bonding or borrowing. Mm -hmm. But, so I don't expect it to get done, but I'll be able to move the needle a little more. Well, I really hope that we can push 
further on the Minnesota Care buy-in. I think a lot of people, um, myself included, are seeing you know increase in our premiums. Our um, in our healthcare dollars aren't going as nearly as far as they can, even though we might have. Um, access to health care that doesn't mean we can afford to go to the doctor because um, high deductibles, co-pays, premiums. So I think if we could really work on the uh, Minnesota Care buy-in, allow people to have access to a statewide network um, where they can choose their doctors, their insurance companies aren't telling them where they can go, um, and have it be an affordable and accessible where they can actually use the health care, um, then that would be, that's something that I'm really excited to work on and, and push. Even with the budget deals passed and signed into law, legislators have left the session with different conclusions on the outcome. There was a lot of policy in finance bills that, um, you know, was something that shouldn't happen. There's some point to the argument because you don't want to put crazy stuff in there. You just want to put policy that the body agrees on. And that's how it's been done for the past 80 some years. I just don't understand why in a year of surplus we made cuts. Um, you know, $400 million cut to Health and Human Services. So I, yeah, I think it was a great way to show that divided government works. Uh, the governor got a lot of his priorities because he's the governor. Uh, that's, how, that's how it works. You don't get all everything you want. And even, even in one party rule, you still don't get everything you want. That's the nature of government. Instead of investing in our schools, in our higher education, in our businesses, in our public safety, transportation, um, you know, we're seeing cuts. And we often hear about government should run as a business, but I don't know any business that when they're making profits lays off workers and, you know, cuts research and development. For North Metro TV News, Ben Hale reporting. The fight at the Capitol is not over. When signing the budget bills into law, Governor Dayton line item vetoed all funding for the legislature. It is his attempt to bring the legislators back to the Capitol to make the budget bills better and redo some provisions in the tax bill. Republican legislators have countered by calling the move unconstitutional and are gearing up for a legal fight.